Yeah. Have you heard of the tutoring app? What app? 2X. It's a tutoring app that connects you to a bunch of tutors for like any subject. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, you can just download it. You can get connected tutors right away. That's awesome. 2X. So you can answer all your questions. Est-ce que vous êtes avec le français avancé? Bien sûr, je suis spécialiste de français. Ici à 2X, on enseigne dans tous les langues. Merci 2X. I still don't understand this Shakespeare quote. Why don't you contact me on 2X and we can set up an appointment and we can talk about it more. Thanks 2X. Giving me the confidence that I can get support with my learning whenever I need it. Hi, I'm pianist Larry Wang, and we're coming to you from Yonkers, New York, at our workshop here. And uh, today, we're going to have an exploration of Brahms and the anxiety of influence. Now, before we begin, I'd like to take some time and thank our wonderful donors who made this all possible. And here they are. Lois Carter, Alyssa Chung, Henry Flory, Callan Fong, Carolyn Zhao, Untek Kim, Verity Long, Sayuri Miyamoto, Enoch Wang, and Susan Jang. Secondly, I'd like to thank our artistic director, Tali Mahanor, for making all of this possible with her wonderful tuning of this instrument here that we're about to hear. And uh, we'll talk a little bit more about this instrument before we begin. And finally, I'd like to thank Jen West and Muse West for graciously uh, accepting this project and presenting it. Now, about this piano. This is a Mason and Hamlin CC1, which is a real behemoth of an instrument. Clocking it at around 1,300 pounds, it easily dwarfs what we consider a concert grand in the Steinway D. Now, this wonderful instrument that we have in front of us is from around 1901, 1902, and was beautifully, beautifully restored by a wonderful craftsman and also beautifully tuned by Tali. And it's gonna be such a joy to share this instrument with you all. Now, on to the piece, Brahms' Opus 5 Piano Sonata. In 1853, Robert Schumann, founder of the Neue Zeitschrift for Musik, famously penned the following words. If he were to wave his magic wand where the massed powers of the chorus and orchestra lend him their force, even more wonderful glimpses into the mysteries of the spirit world would be in store for us. May the highest genius lend him strength, for which the prospects are good. For another genius, that of modesty, dwells within him. His comrades greet him upon his first journey through the world, where wounds perhaps await him, but also laurels and palms. We welcome a strong champion in him. Now, the him to whom Schumann was referring was, of course, the 20-year-old Johannes Brahms. And the rest, as they often say, was history. This incredibly effusive outpouring of support from the established Schumann pushed the young Brahms quickly into the musical spotlight. Now, in an almost immediate reply, privately, of course, Brahms wrote back, the praise that you openly bestowed upon me will arouse such extraordinary expectation of my achievements by the public that I don't know how I can begin to fulfill them even somewhat. Above all else, it induces in me the greatest caution in the choice of which pieces to publish. In these early words, the words of a 20-year-old, we already see the seeds of two recurring themes throughout Brahms' career, namely his fear of failure to live up to expectations and the great caution with which he unveiled his music to the public. In fact, he was notoriously cagey about publishing his works and would destroy many of the works uh, that he deemed not up to standard. Now, in his big debut into the limelight of the music scene of the day, Brahms was now firmly tied to the musical ideals of Robert Schumann who had become increasingly conservative 
in nature as he aged. And the prospect of upholding that symphonic mantle that had been left by the previous great master of the genre, Ludwig von Beethoven. Now, as any music student can attest, the prospect of not living up to the expectations of a mentor, of a teacher, and mostly of yourself, it can be crippling. So, is it any wonder that the young starry-eyed Brahms would have been all but completely bowed over by such praise? Now, it is through this lens, through the exploration of the effects of expectation and influence upon the young Brahms that yield some interesting insights into this massive and truly seminal piano work, the Opus 5 Piano Sonata. Now, this phrase, which is in the title of this lecture recital, the anxiety of influence, was coined by literary critic Harold Bloom in order to analyze poetry and the inherent influences that endanger young poets and in their attempt to create original and non-derivative works. In Bloom's view, influence is almost universally damaging and represents an obstacle, an almost Freudian obstacle, that must be overcome by the young artist. Now, when it comes to this piece, the Opus 5, Brahms composed it concurrently with his arrival at the Schumann household and his ascension into musical stardom. So in many ways, it bears musical fruits from the intense pressure inspiration of this time in his life. And in fact, as the last of his genre in Brahms' output, this would be, despite such an early opus at opus five and only the third of his piano sonatas, it would be the very last time that Brahms would visit this genre in his career. And this piece features some indelible marks of influences from the plainly stated, as we'll see in the first movement, to the less concrete and subtler signs of Brahms' struggle with the whispers of his predecessors and heroes. Now, before we dive in depth into each movement, let's briefly speak of the piece as a whole. Now, the sonata is unique in many ways, but especially in the arrangement of its movements. It is a five movement sonata, and which is highly irregular. We have more commonly four movement sonatas, three movement sonatas, even two movement sonatas, especially in the case of uh, Haydn and Beethoven, we see many two movement sonatas. However, five movement was something that was out of the ordinary. If we look at it a little bit more closely, we see that the overall structure is one of a four movement piece with your expected sonata allegro, slow movement, scherzo, and rondo finale. But we have one extra movement inserted. Now, for a composer as meticulous and well thought out and studied as Brahms, uh, any action would have been premeditated and done with incredibly specific reasoning. And so this extra movement, which is the penultimate intermezzo movement, uh, we'll dive a little bit into it when we get to, this, to talk about that movement and why it's so special. Now, let us move on to movement number one. Now, could Brahms have written a more obsessively driven and focused first movement? It's hard to imagine so. From the very beginning uh, fusillade of titanic chords, we already see that there is a very clear obsession with this bum ba da bum rhythm. Now, this rhythm which, uh, if explained in poetic terms, a la Bloom, would be a dactylic rhythm, which is a stressed syllable followed by two unstressed syllables. And uh, as, a, as a very uh, common metrical foot, it does hearken to something that is a, maybe a little bit more specific. And the specific reference, in my ears at least, is 
to Beethoven's Seventh Symphony, the second movement. In the first phrase, it might not be completely evident. The second phrase, he removes all doubt. And in fact, if you had further doubts about the reference, Brahms would add more to convince you otherwise. Which very obviously is the so-called fate motive from Beethoven's Fifth Symphony. Now, these two motives, one from the Seventh Symphony and the other from the Fifth, would go on to populate this entire movement. In fact, most of the thematic material from this entire movement is derived from one of these two rhythmic motives. Now, if we look at, say, for example, really any passage, but let's say the transition passage into the secondary key area, where we have this. The right hand is a rhythm derived from a simplification of that dactyl, and the left hand is a literal repetition. And then if we go on to the second theme, it becomes an expansion, an augmentation of this rhythm and contour. And then the development, if we go on further, we get the so-called new material in the development. Which is once again a further development of that dactylic rhythm now cleverly flipped and into, into an anapest, meaning two unaccented uh, beats followed by an accented beat. So as we can see, the material in this first movement is remarkably concise and it's remarkably focused in a way that is reminiscent, frankly, of Beethoven's own compositional style. And this instance, that, that these couple of instances that I've showed you here are really a few of many examples of what Schoenberg would later characterize as developing variation, which was a technique of integrating and creating varied musical material from the manipulation of small motives. But most importantly about developing variation, it's not that just that this one motive appears everywhere, but that it saturates the texture of the music on different levels, from both the background all the way up to the foreground. Now, I think here it's important to note that even contemporary music critics, such as Adolf Schubring, noted the similarities of Brahms' work to Beethoven's piano works. In his critique of Opus 5, Schubring makes an astute observation about the seeming stiffness that Brahms' obsessive adherence to the rhythmic material lends to the flow of the first movement. Now, the critic is perhaps even more insightful when he compares it to the similarly keyed Appassionata of Beethoven, also an F minor, and also a piece where that rhythm, the fate rhythm, appears. And the main difference between these two pieces in terms of large scale structuring uh, is not any key relationships or even motivic adherence, but rather the presence of a motoric ostinato drive that propels the Beethoven from the very beginning to the very end of the movement, which we don't really see in Brahms's. Now, Brahms, because Brahms's doesn't have the same uh, rhythmic analog, there is a certain sense of space, and perhaps a kinder way to say it is grandeur to this Sonata Allegro movement. Uh, seen as a, a criticism, it is perhaps uh, not such a kind way of writing about the first movement, but and looking at the flip side, it is the hallmarks of a young and incredibly zealous 
an obviously talented and studied composer applying all the lessons that he has learned from his predecessors. And with such technical mastery, and this is already evident in this very first movement, it's really quite easy to forget that this is the work of a 20-year-old Brahms. Moving on to the second movement, the second movement is perhaps one of the most effusive and beautiful movements that Brahms would ever write. And it begins, curiously, with an inscription from a poem by Sternow. Now, this is a device that was made famous by Schumann's mentor, uh, excuse me, Brahms's mentor Schumann in his Opus 17 fantasy, where he also similarly inscribed poetry before the beginning of the first movement of the piece. Now, in this piece, in Brahms's case, the poem reads, Twilight falls, the moonlight shines, two hearts are united in love and keep themselves in bliss enclosed. The implications of this poetic setting are quite obvious and quite striking. And in fact, can be traced quite literally through the entire movement. From the very first notes, we get are introduced to two distinctive lines that are intertwined in their melodies. Now, in fact, this duet will follow through the entire movement from this very beginning to the poco piulento section which is incredibly beautiful. When we have these sixths chasing each other is perhaps the most musically illustrative and beautiful examples of how Brahms would go on to, to uh, illustrate the contents of the poem with each, each couplet of sorts chasing each other with the chords, in fact, taking the note of the previous set of pairs in this almost chase, in this embrace, this musical embrace that happens. Now this culminates in the sh when the meter shifts to 3-8 and now instead of the voices chasing each other like we have here, we go into a full-blown duet now with both voices finally in the right hand. With all of this talk of chaste love and hearts embracing each other, the references to Beethoven have been scant. And in fact, there have not been any up to this point. Now, in the coda, Brahms could not help himself. In fact, we see at the very beginning of the coda, a augmented version of the fate motive. Bringing once again a distant reference to his predecessor. Now, there's a one more instance in this coda that the influence is a little bit more subtle and a little bit more insidious. And I think this example is uh, more akin to what Bloom speaks of when he speaks of the anxiety of influence, where the work of the predecessor emerges almost subconsciously through the composition of the, of the younger artist. Now, this passage we have... Mm. 
have keen ears, you might recognize that that progression is very, very familiar. And you're right. In fact, it's very similar in voice leading and progression to this. Which is the famous second movement of the Seventh Symphony, once again. The references abound. Moving on to the third movement, the third movement, the scherzo movement, which would be our uh, traditional third movement. Uh, the scherzo movement is perhaps the simplest of the five movements. Uh, it, it does feature more borrowed material, again, in this case, very much stated as reference in the very opening of the piece. So the very first phrase is... Which, of course, is the literal taking of the theme of the last movement of Mendelssohn's C minor piano trio. Aside from that, however, the movement is quite straightforward. It's bombastic, it's virtuosic, it is in its own way verging on the Listian. It's difficult, there's a lot of leaps. However, the he, Brahms sh just shies away from outright virtuosity, sitting right at the line, enjoying the difficulty and perhaps the struggle that it puts the pianist through to play the music. Now, as in typical scherzo fashion, there is a middle section, a trio section. Now, in this case, the trio section is in a chorale texture, which is something, a topic that uh, Brahms would come back to, not only again in this piece, but become an incredibly fruitful musical topic for Brahms throughout his entire career. Think about any of his later piano pieces or his, the, the great brass chorale in the first symphony. Now we hear a little bit of that. Now after this phrase, we have one more reminder of who is lurking in the shadows. So the fate motive from Beethoven's fifth pops up one more time, very quickly, casts its shadow, and then disappears. Finally, we move on to perhaps the most interesting and the heart of this entire sonata, the intermezzo, the extraneous, in some ways, fourth movement. It's subtitled Ruchblich, which means recollection or looking back. And really, this movement uh, embodies everything that that word means, a recollection. What this movement is, is the taking of previous themes and materials, recombining them and recollecting, right? It's the, it's the veil of memory about previous events. So if we see from the very first phrase, stunningly obvious. Right, this right hand, and then the left hand is once again Beethoven. It's a simple double binary form, and I think, as 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 a personal take, I think that Brahms here is once again taking on Beethoven and almost in his own terms. The, the reference about a recollection is, again, clearly aimed at uh, one of Beethoven's symphonic works, uh, the Ninth Symphony this time, where, where in the, at the beginning of the very final movement of that piece, Beethoven recollects all of the material from previous movements and each time shunts it away to make way for the burgeoning Ode to Joy. Now, Brahms engaging in a sort of musical one-upsmanship uh, instead of just literally referencing the material from previous movements, instead takes it, as I showed you, and recontextualizes it. For example, the second, second movement uh, melody is now in minor. And other, other ways of manipulating that he does to the material in a way that casts it in a new light. 
However, in another way, Brahms also uh, takes a step back from some of the structural innovations that Beethoven made in, in his so-called version, I guess, in that it's not a separate movement. It is simply the introduction into the finale of the Ninth Symphony. So in, in some ways, Brahms takes a step forwards. In other ways, he kind of takes a step backwards. However, this movement is much more important than just the fact that it brings back old material. In fact, if we think about the piece with a certain program, up to this point, the program has been that the shadow of Beethoven is looming at his back. And this is a sentiment that Brahms would have throughout his entire life. In fact, uh, during the writing of the first symphony in, in his letters, he, this is precisely the wording that he would use when speaking about the, the compositional process uh, of that symphony, which we know took him 20 years. Um, and so through this Rukblik, he almost culls all of those influences, really distills them all into one place, and is then able to remove them. And as we move on into the finale, we can see that. Because in the finale, there is one thing that is missing. And that one thing is any reference to Beethoven. There is no fate motive. There is no dactyl. The, the fifth movement, the ultimate movement here, the, the rondo, ties up all the loose ends and it moves forwards in a almost raucous way. This last movement is incredibly energetic, incredibly um, ostentatious for Brahms. In fact, perhaps the most ostentatious that Brahms would ever get. Um, it's crackling with energy from the very beginning. With the sharpness of rhythm. And then when we get to our first contrasting section that we expect in a rondo form, we get, once again, a referential material. This time not Beethoven, but perhaps this single reference uh, in my reading is the most telling for what Brahms is saying in the writing of this piece. So this is the B section of the last movement. Now, what is this theme? If we look at the notes, it's now, this was the famous motto of Brahms' dear friend, Josef Joachim, uh, F-A-E, or in German, Frei aber einsam, free but alone. Now, this speaks volumes, free but alone. What is he free of? Well, he's free of Beethoven. And now he's stepping into this final movement, unafraid, by himself, and fully embracing the, some of the more forward-looking components of Brahms' style. Now, this movement is for sure the most forward-looking. There's a lot of things that we would expect in a rondo. For example, the, that B material, most likely, if it were, for example, a Schubert rondo sonata finale, that B material would come back in the recapitulation. In Brahms' case, it does not. We get our second set of contrasting material with more chorales. Now, we said before in the third movement that the chorale was a topic that Brahms would go to many, many times. And this one is particularly the apotheosis of this victorious, energetic chorale. It's this material, not the FAE, not the first contrasting material, which would come to, to dominate the rest of the movement. And in fact, when we do typically expect the return of that first B material, we launch into an extended coda that is almost entirely based upon that chorale. This is incredible because in the accompanimental section, what he's doing is he's actually taking and turning it into the contrapuntal line on top of which 
sits the canis firmus. And this is what we were saying before about developing variations, taking each cell of material and putting it into the different levels of the music. And this is Brahms again now flexing his contrapuntal muscles, which uh, at this point in his life, he was studying in earnest alongside Joachim and Remenyi and working on his compositional craft. So all in all, for the, for the um, accomplishments of a 20-year-old Brahms, it's quite incredible to see um, what he is able to create despite or maybe because of all the influences that were percolating in his artistic spirit at the time. Now, having toured all five movements of the behemoth of a piece, that is Brahms' Opus 5, all that is left now is the playing. Enjoy. 
this wonderful little transcription by pianist Egon Petri of Bach's The Sheep Shall Safely Graze. Thank you.